So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is LeVon Esters. Um, I'm a professor here at Purdue University, um, and I'm the uh, co-director of the Mentoring at Purdue program, or we like to call the MAP program. I see some familiar faces and names on the screen, so most, if not all of you, are familiar with the work that we do. And again, I appreciate you all being here today. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, share with you a description of today's session. Uh, I will then uh, allow the uh, each of the speakers, each of the panelists to introduce themselves. And so panelists, when we get to that point, what I would simply like for you to do is uh, share your name and then your role at your respective institution. And um, uh, maybe if you want to share your research expertise or your area of expertise, that'll be ideal as well. And then after that, then we'll jump into the questions um, and audience members, um, uh, as is the case in all of our workshops, uh, our webinar, excuse me, the panelists receive the questions in advance so they can kind of prep and be prepared. But also during the course of the exchange, I will uh, jot down notes. So you may see me look down because I'm jotting down notes to add additional, ask additional questions. So uh, welcome again to today's webinar topic, allyship and mentoring. Um, uh, one, let me read for you a description. Uh, so graduate students desire to surround themselves with individuals who will have an integral role in their growth and development. It is important for them to differentiate between allies and mentors and to understand where these roles may overlap. This workshop or this webinar will feature strategies and advice from a panel of experts about how to be a more effective leader, mentor, and ally to graduate students while defining the similarities and differences in these roles. So uh, again, um, one other thing before we begin, please, please, please be mindful if there are questions you want to pose to the panelists, please throw those into the chat or write them down, commit them to memory. Um, I have a great team that will be monitoring those uh, questions in the in the chat and they will let me know. Uh, they will keep me on task as relates to asking those questions. Uh, so please be mindful of that. And other thing I want to mention is that at the end of our near the end of our webinar today, there will be a, a very short, uh, it'll be a link uh, that you can click on that would take you to a webinar evaluation. Uh, it takes less than five minutes, if that long, for you to complete. So I would kindly um, appreciate if you could fill that out as well. So uh, and we'll give you another reminder on that at the end. So what I want to do is uh, we have three panels today. I, I know all three of them uh, fairly well, some more than others, but I'm familiar with their work and they do great work. And so what I want to do is now is turn it over to, uh, in the order that we have listed on here, Dr. Newby, Dr. Rubel, and Dr. Wallace. So Dr. Newby, if you could introduce yourself, uh, what institution you work at, and what your role is, and if you want to share some of your expertise as well, that would be ideal. Hey, I can do that. Um, so I am Leonard D.T. Newby, Professor of Special Education at Langston University. I'm also a mentor and advisor for Building Relationships, Overcoming Stigmas, or BROS, which is a collegiate male-centered organization that uh, works to transcend and redefine what it means to be a man at Langston and in America as a whole. Um, my current research examines stereotype threat and its impact on men in education. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rupel. Hi, I'm Audrey Rupel, and I'm an assistant professor here at Purdue University. I'm in the Department of Public Health, and my area of expertise is in One Health Epidemiology. So that's studying health and disease at the interface of humans, animals, and their shared environments. I'm also the chair of the university's um, or the Senate's Purdue University Senate's Equity and Diversity Committee, which is how I've really primarily engaged in equity and diversity work at this university. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Dr. Wallace. Hello. Uh, and yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Kent Wallace. I am from the Department of Physics at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, which is one of our traditional HBCUs and one of the first. Uh, the work that I do is primarily in, uh, though my background is in astronomy and rocketry, uh, my work is basically using those type of curriculum to broaden participation and get more participation of people of color and women in the math intensive sciences. Yeah, and I should mention, uh, you all should follow or check out Dr. Wallace's work. I mean, he's really good at flying rockets. So uh, I've known him for now six years at least. And so he really does some fascinating work at Fisk. And, and I'm glad that he, as well as Dr. Rubel and Dr. Newby that you're on this panel today. So without further ado, let's jump right in, if you will. So I have uh, 
several questions I want to get through. My goal is to get through all questions, but um, what I want to do is take us to about 1245 or so and then open it up to the audience for them to ask questions as well. So uh, what I want to do, Dr. Rupert, if I could start with you with this question. So the first question I have here is, what is the difference between an, an ally and a mentor? And again, Dr. Rupert, once you get through that, we'll We'll cycle through Dr. Newby and Dr. Wallace for you to chime in as well. So Dr. Rubel, again, what is the difference between an ally and a mentor? Sure. So mentorship for me is really an individual experience of building a relationship with an individual mentee and then really helping to guide them in their professional life. And that can take the role of looking at their professional knowledge and their skills, but also how they um, their rapport with their colleagues and how they relate with their peers. And so I, I feel like mentorship is a really individualized experience, whereas allyship I see as being more about not just building um, bridges on the individual level and breaking down barriers at the individual level, but really looking at the systemic barriers and trying to address and attack and break down systemic issues um, that are affecting more than an individual. So the kind of larger piece um, that's, that for me is the real difference between the two. Doctor, thank you, Dr. Ruby. Dr. Newby, what would you want to add above and beyond what was shared through your lens of uh, the difference between an, an, an ally and a mentor? Uh, above and beyond, I feel like my answer is going to be very similar. Uh, ultimately, we know that a mentor can be any individual who takes an interest in advancing another person's education, their career, their personal life, or overall being as a whole. Um, but as stated earlier, the difference would be an ally. They don't have to be a required or they don't have to be a person who is a more knowledgeable other or more experienced. Their role is to be an advocate. Right. Um, they're your cheerleaders and your voice and you're not in a position to be heard. And not only that, but uh, it's important that allies, they intentionally take steps to eliminate individual systemic barriers that face people. I mean, that people face as they work toward their specific goals. Good. Thank you. And Dr. Wallace, what about yourself? You similar. To similar to Dr. Newby, of course, you work at an HBCU. For those that don't know, <laughs> Langston University is an HBCU located in Langston, Oklahoma, and then Fisk University is in the great city of Nashville. So, Dr. Wallace, uh, what would you want to share about this, these differences? Well, you know, I, I could think of it more like akinning it to uh, the strategic allies in World War II. The allies, you have the allies and you have the Axis powers, but ultimately <laughs> it's a conglomeration of individuals that are working towards a common goal when you think of allies. Whereas mentorship um, is kind of more inter it, it, more personal, if you will, as Dr. Rupal had mentioned. So they can be, they can share some of the same qualities. But if I think of the allies like social capital, people who you know and can interact with that can uh, produce resources to a goal, and that, those allies can help you when you're working with that mentor or that mentee because then they will say, oh, well, here's a person whom I know. I think you should talk to them because they, they, they do research in this area and therefore you can hand that off to them. So I, 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 I see them, one is more macroscopic and I see the other is a little more microscopic. I'll stay with you for a minute and I'll come back through again, Dr. Rubel and Dr. Newby. So, so could you maybe talk for a minute, Dr. Wallace, about the overlap? So what, to what degree is there overlap between those two? Sure. Um, so let's say you had an individual that was working in a middle school, like a, a student, graduate student, undergraduate student. They wanted to go to a school in their neighborhood and uh, help kids in, with a science club. OK, now, if you're doing research where you're do, working with middle schools, that person can, in fact, be an ally because that person has an access to a school that you might want to get into. But at the same time, you being a mentor can say, hey, you're doing great work here, but here's what the research says about these interactions with kids. And you might want to think about doing this in, when you're interacting with the kids. So now you're mentoring that individual in, in their practice, but they're also an ally because now you might have an avenue of working in that school for your bringing diversity to STEM in the work that you do as a professor. Good. Dr. Rubel, I see you're shaking your head and I also want to acknowledge you you do and I really appreciate your role in the equity and diversity committee for Purdue. So what would you talk how what would you want to say about the overlap between these two roles? Well that was a fantastic example that Dr. Wallace just gave. But you know one of the things that I think Dr. Newby mentioned earlier is advocacy. And I think that that's a, a place where both of these can really overlap. 
because quite often when we're individually advocating for a mentee or we're, it's part of our role as a mentor when we're doing advocacy work, I think a lot of that can actually be expanded upon and really be part of allyship too. And I think that that piece, that advocacy piece that happens both at the individual and at the group level, and I, I would see that as being a real um, prime place of overlap. Okay, good. Dr. Newby, anything you want to say about overlap? I don't think I'm going to add anything that the other have already stated. So, okay. All right. So let me ask you this then, Dr. Uh, Newby, how do you know when it's appro most appropriate to be an ally opposed to a mentor then? That's a great question. Um, my suggestion would um, be to always strive to be both, right? Um, the great thing about mentorship and allyship is that they're not mutually exclusive. You don't have to be one and not be the other, right? Um, however, to not cop out of the question, um, I'll note that there will be plenty of uh, instances where mentees may have very little to like no voice at all in specific situations. Um, this can be in faculty meetings or organizational meetings, conferences, um, personal conversations amongst colleagues and any other professional setting that you may not find a grad student. To me, this is the best time to be an ally. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rubel, what would you say? Is there, how would you know when it's appropriate to be uh, one or the other? Or should you be yeah. them at the same time as Dr. Numi just alluded to? I, so I do agree with that, that, that they are not mutually exclusive. I do think that, I mean, for me, I feel like allyship and mentorship, like those are things that you live. It's an embodiment. And so that's not something that I think you can flip on and off with a switch. I will say that there is um, a particular nuance to that that I'll, I'll just add, which is that sometimes that individual level mentorship can backfire. And that if you are speaking up and on behalf of an individual person, if there's any retaliation, that retaliation may not land on your shoulders, but on the shoulders of the person you're trying to mentor. Um, in which case, I think that allyship sometimes is a better where you're depersonalizing the argument. And it's not about trying to advocate for that one individual, but rather for a group of individuals, just in order to kind of deflect some of that retaliation, which sometimes happens. An excellent point. I've never heard that mentioned before. So I really appreciate that. So hopefully the audience make, took note of that. Uh, Dr. Wallace, did you want to add anything about when the appropriateness of being an ally or a mentor? Well, you know, just building off of the scenario that she had just given that when you have a, a when you have a really robust sense of allies, then when an individual does need you to be an advocate for them. And it's interesting because the moment you told me about this, I knew the word advocate would have to come up because you really it makes the, the, the mentorship that much stronger. But I just quickly state that if, if you have an individual that uh, might uh, have be, if you have a mentee that might be having an issue with somebody who you may consider an ally, having that relationship can have you, can give you a place to speak on a personal level and intervene and say, hey, you know, I really know the student and the way you're characterizing them isn't the way that I know them. There may be something behind that. Or as their mentor, you may know personal information about this this uh, mentee and therefore it's saying, well, I could see why you would think that, but based on the things that I know, they reacted because of this. And then that ally might be like, well, because they have a lot of respect for you. It's like, oh, okay. I never considered that. I'll, I'll, I'll factor that in, in my decision-making. Uh, you know, I really enjoy this conversation this far because I would imagine that a lot of folks on this, on this call that maybe not have the distinctions between the two. So I'm really finding this fascinating. So Dr. Rubel, if I could start with you with this. So what are, what are the opportunities and limitations, if any, of being an ally? Okay, this is a really great question. And this is one of, uh, when you'd sent those questions ahead of time, this is one that I really spent probably the most time reflecting on. I think that there's a lot of opportunities on an individual level for being an ally. In fact, for me, this work that I have done, this is the most impactful work that I've done in academia has been through allyship and through mentorship. And I don't mean impactful in terms of research citations or in terms of grant dollars, but impactful on a truly person level. Like this is the work that we do that really does impact people to go and have better lives. Um, I'm a big believer of that. And that is something that is that's an amazing opportunity. Um, one of the, the less beautiful parts of being an ally, one of the limitations um, is that sometimes people respond to allyship and advocacy from a place of fear, and that can sometimes be aggressive. Um, one of the experiences that I've had is have, I have had threats made against me 
and not by people at the university, but by people in the um, greater community. Because sometimes the work that we do ends up getting some media attention and that media attention does often come with a backlash. And so there are, there are threats. Um, it's not for the weak of heart. <laughs> I'm not trying to discourage anybody either because I think it's really important work, um, but it's important work that needs to be done with eyes wide open and just recognizing that it's not necessarily something you're going to walk away from unscathed. Uh, that's an excellent point, Dr. Rubel, and I'm glad you shared that because I think it's important for individuals to know what they're getting into, if you will, um, and, and you and I are similar because we share some of the same interests in, in this work in this space, and so it can cause some backlash, if you will. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Dr. Um, Dr. Newby, what would you want to say about opportunities and limitations uh, uh, that you see? I, I just want to speak to the opportunities, actually. I know that we should touch on the limitations, but I feel like the opportunities, they supersede, I guess you could say, uh, these limitations, right? I think I'm going to talk about how being an ally, it does provide individuals the opportunity to develop relationships with a wider range of people, um, they're able to collect more accurate information about uh, people that they may not necessarily find themselves around. And not only that, but um, they're constantly changed, I mean, challenged to address their own implicit biases um, and stereotype beliefs. Uh, thank you. What about you, Dr. Wallace? What would you want to say about either opportunities or limitations? Well, you know, I find that even limitations are opportunities when you think mm. about it, because things that are negative are potentials where you can do something to turn it into positives. I, when I was thinking of this, when I was hearing you talk, I thought of an ally that I came, came across was from, I was, I was part of a, an incident that happened after uh, the Starbucks racial incident a couple of years ago and something similar almost happened in Tennessee. And I helped, I intervened to try to defuse the situation and I thought it was such a powerful experience. I wrote an article about it as an op-ed in the Tennessean, our local paper. And that led to two people from the School of Nursing at Vanderbilt uh, asking if I would be interested in talking to their nursing class about empathy as practice for their nurses. And here I am, a physics professor. Uh, but that, that, that relationship turned into an ally because they asked me to come back every year after that. Unfortunately, one of those gentlemen literally passed away last week. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but the woman I still have the relationship with. But again, that ally came from a challenging situation. And that article did not, people looked, I didn't know this actually happens. They looked up my email address and I got a lot of emails, not all of them positive. So you can put yourself out there, but the way I look at it is, if you're really doing stuff that's groundbreaking or you're doing stuff that's really impacting something important, then you're going to get that opposition because if you didn't, it wouldn't have been a problem in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. You know, I wrote down limitations lead to opportunities. And, uh, you know, again, I mentioned everyone, I've known you for about six years or so, Dr. Wallace, and you are the epitome of a half glass full person. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, I, and I would also add to that, that yeah, if, being a leader, part of being a leader comes with facing oppositional forces. So that just comes with the territory. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Dr. Newby, we can move on to this question. So how can we build trust as we become allies to others? Uh, well, to build trust, I'm thinking, I was trying to put like uh, this, all right, so I'll say this. Maybe we need to make sure that we ask, listen, show up, and speak out, right? So when I say ask, I'm talking about asking your mentees about their experiences, and not only that, but sharing your experiences as well. Um, ultimately, open up that communication, right? But you also want to make sure that you're listening with soft ears and empathy as a whole, right? And making sure that we um, are open to understanding the different perspectives of our mentees and our students as a whole. Um, you also want to make sure that you show up I think I said speak out as well, right? So show up um, by being present and committed to whatever goals that uh, you and your mentees have set forth for, um, for your mentee. Um, and not only that, but you want to speak up for them as well. Advocate whenever possible, wherever possible. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wallace, what about you? What would, how do you build trust uh, when it comes to being an ally? Um, when it comes to being an ally, the first and foremost thing is be if do what you say you're going to do, 
Um, if you're, you can't speak out about something and then when you're faced with that same thing, you cower in your corner. That's gonna be the first way to destroy uh, a great deal of trust. So, you know, be a person of your word um, and don't be afraid. And it's hard for me to tell someone what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of. But what I do know is that if you're stepping into that role of leadership, you know that job was dangerous when you took it. I remember having a colleague that a lot of people didn't really care for this person because she was a very, she wasn't rude. She was just very direct. And when I was, when you're surrounded a lot around a lot of people that might be passive aggressive, direct is really a way to piss people off. But I would, ne but I knew for a fact that they never would say anything negative about this individual to me because I'm going to be like, one, why aren't you talking to her? Or then even two, I would always be that advocate and say, well, if you look at it, she looked at the evidence, blah, 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 blah. And right. there is a conclusion to be drawn. So I, I just say that to build that trust, it's when the enemies are at the gate that you're standing there true to the word that you have presented to people prior to that event. Yeah, Dr. Ruben, what about you? What, how do you build trust as an ally? Um, these are great conversations to be building on top of. So there's a lot that's already been mentioned. I, I think that the speaking up is a really important one. I think that we have created, especially in academia, we have a culture of, of um, silence. And so I think being willing to speak up and being bold and courageous in our words and in our actions, the following through, the doing what we say we're going to do, those things are important. The always being honest, also recognizing we're never done learning um, owning our own mistakes, I think, is another really big part of building trust and allyship because we're not going to always get it right. And being willing to own it when you make a mistake or when you make a misstep, I think that's really important. Um, and then another one that I think is equally important is being able to develop the skill to just decenter yourself and make it not about you. I think that that's a really important part of building trust. Yeah, let me tell you, this, this, this uh, exchange it's like an independent study, just so you all know that. So um, I'm really enjoying this. And, and to build on what you just said, uh, Dr. Rubel, you mentioned this notion of being in the academy, it, it has uh, conjures up or it facilitates uh, silence, but also conformity and status quo, which I'm anti both, as, as uh, people on here know, especially my grad students know that. So I really appreciate you mentioning uh, the, the notion of silence. Uh, so Dr. Rubel, uh, how would you advise a mentor to adequately serve as an ally and supporter in spaces that may be unfamiliar to their experience? It's a really great question. And it's one that I don't know that I'm gonna have really salient advice on, but kind of big picture piece of that one is that I think, in or oh, sorry. So in order to really um, be good in this work is you've got to really first and foremost believe that this struggle belongs to you. It's not somebody else's struggle, it is your struggle. It is yours to own, it is yours to fight for. I think that um, it's okay to be unfamiliar with, with, with specific experiences. I mean, obviously the lived experiences that other people have, like those are things that we're not gonna all have overlapping, um, overlapping thoughts on or overlapping experiences with. I think it's really important that we make an effort to make sure that we are doing our own best um, job of being really true about who we are and, and, and unbiasing kind of developing and, and learning our own biases and trying to dismantle those internally. And then I think that really, as long as we're focused on greater good, then this is a, this is a way that we can move towards um, good mentorship and allyship, even in spaces that we're not familiar with. I appreciate that. Um, before we go on, before I ask the question of the other two panelists, I want to ask the question again, because someone just, uh, Angela asked me to do so. The question is again, uh, for Dr. Newby and Dr. Wallace, how would you advise a mentor to adequately serve as an ally and supporter in spaces that may be unfamiliar to the experience? So having repeated that question, Dr. Newby, how would you respond to that? Dr. Newby, you're on mute. I do this about five times a day. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, what I would do is tell a mentor to uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I'm thinking about how, uh, well, what we all know is, is that discomfort is a critical part of learning. So it's important that we do embrace that, right? I'm also thinking about how we need to consider focusing on the needs 
um, that we're able to meet instead of the ones that we may struggle with, right? So if we find ourselves um, charting unfamiliar territory, it's still important to focus on like what your strengths are and what you can help with and not the things that may, uh, that you may struggle with, right? Thank you. Dr. Wallace, what about, how would you respond to that? How would you advise a mentor to adequately serve as an ally support in a space that may be unfamiliar to them and the experience? No, I'm really glad this question came up because um, one of the things I did want to make sure I said sometime in this whole discussion is that as a mentor, we have to be humble in the sense that we don't know it all. And there are times where you may not be the best person suited to serve in that mentorship role, which is where you can draw on the allyship. So if I had a young lady that's a black female in computer science and she was having misgivings about going into computer science because no one in the class is like her and she's you know getting opposition by she's getting a little ostracized because she's the woman in the class okay one i can relate to her being black but not necessarily as a woman i can be empathetic but i cannot speak to things through an experience so what i might want to do is draw upon my allies and say there is an individual who is a computer programmer, a doctorate in computer programming has been in industry and in education. I really would like to put you two together because I think that she can tell you how to navigate certain spaces that I would never have had to navigate. And so it's, the, it's drawing upon your resources to best fit that advocate and also having the, the humility to hand them off and not think that, because sometimes, in as a university, we have a pressure that we've got to have all the answers. And sometimes the answer is that you don't have it and that you can give it to the person, to a person who would be better suited for it. And that takes a lot of courage on yourself. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, before I go to the next question, I want to remind everyone, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat, write them down, uh, because we will be opening up for questions after a while uh, to the audience. So please be mindful of questions uh, that come up. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Wallace, let me start with you with this. So it's a long question, but follow me. We usually prefer to be mentored by people who look like us or who have had similar experiences. What benefits could there be to seek mentorship from someone who has a totally different outlook than we do? Okay, so I gotta throw in the civil rights movement when I say this, because civil rights, you know, it's clear that there needed to be a bill for civil rights because of all the atrocities that were taking place across the country. But let's remember, there weren't a lot of black people in Congress. That bill was passed by whites primarily. And so that took allyship. And so it, you don't have to be marred in this idea that a person has to have your experience or has to look like you in order to be valuable in terms of what they can offer. So the same thing applies to mentorship and allyship because people can be empathetic to your situation or they, um, they can have the same goal as you, but they're coming from it from a different perspective of, I see an injustice that may not be affecting me, but I don't want, to, I don't want that to exist. So this is the space that I choose to work in. So I do understand how it's so comforting to work with an individual that looks like you or shares your experience because that's something that, especially if you're in STEM, you're not surrounded by that a lot. But you always have to be open to the idea and you can't go in with the assumption that the, though they may not look or share your cultural experience, that they still cannot be empathetic or be a positive impact upon you. Dr. Rubel, how, how would you respond to that? You know, this notion of you, we prefer to be mentored by people who look like us or have had similar experiences. What business could it be to seek mentorship from someone who has a totally different outlook than we do? Yeah, so I think that this is actually, again, just a really important question, but this is something that I think really then gets at the core of what mentorship really means. And I think um, the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity has this really great um, paradigm for mentorship where it is about mentorship mapping and so it's not about you've got the one mentor even the two or three mentors that give you all the information but it's about you've got different mentors for different parts of your profession for different parts of your life and there is not even I, I actually have a mentorship map and that for me is an actual physical drawing that looks like a mind map kind of a thing and there's not a lot of overlap between those different categories and so I think that 
some of the strongest um, mentorship relationships that I've personally benefited from have been the ones that are the people that are the most different from me, the people that have walked really different paths. Because quite often the perspective that they're giving me is something that is truly something that I have not thought of, truly something that is outside of their realm. I mean, you can't know what you don't know. And so by having that perspective from people that know a different, different side of life or a different reality um, than you do, I find that to be really valuable. Thank you. Dr. Newby, how would you respond to the question about the benefits and seeking mentorship from someone who has a di totally different outlook than we do? All right. Look, I had to make sure I was off mute this time. Uh, either way, um, I think we can use the uh, windows and mirrors in it over here. Um, it's natural to want a mentor that men I mean, the mirrors or reflect your own culture um, because it helps to build your identity. It can also help to prove that the impossible, what you may believe to be impossible is possible, right? However, in seeking mentorship from individuals who may have a different outlook, um, that can create this window um, to learn and experience opportunities that we didn't necessarily know existed. Um, I think I'll stop right there. Just, just going back to that whole windows and mirrors ended up there. Okay, and Dr. Wallace, anything you want to add? Um, no, my okay. colleagues, they, they, they touched that perfectly. Okay. So, Dr. Wallace, then what steps uh, do you recommend in finding someone who has a different perspective? You know, because, again, it was mentioned that we naturally want to go to someone that looks like us. But how, what advice would you have for those on, on this on this webinar today who, who may feel uncomfortable, who may not know how to seek out different perspectives? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there's no one good answer. Um, I will say for me, from my experience, it never happened quite where I sought them out. It happened organically. You get into a conversation and you see that you have countering views. But what I really love and what I really appreciate is that when I'm having a conversation that we could be polar opposites on our perspective. And in any other situation, I would just be getting infuriated and passionate. But we had a really civil discussion. That's a person who I need on my team. Because I cannot tell you the number of discussions I've had that just devolved into name calling. And that's like when I'm done. But when I find an individual that can have a presence of mind to have a, uh, an intellectual conversation, even though we have differences of opinion, I'm, a kind of, I'm kind of attracted to that. Though I may be a little put off by necessarily their position, but I really appreciate the fact that it was civil and that there was a respect in the exchange of ideas. So my just says this, at least, do not have to be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations and do not feel like you have to kowtow to an opposing perspective because people who oppose your view will respect the fact that you had enough guts and had the information to support your arguments. So that takes courage, that takes humility, and it takes open-mindedness. Excellent. So Dr. Ruba, I want to pose the same question to you. You know, what steps do you recommend in finding someone who has a different perspective? And I'm really interested because of the work you do on the Equity Diversity Committee. And I imagine you're required to engage in these in, in seeking out these different perspectives. So could you talk about how would you respond to that question? Yeah. So yes, I do res I do end up working in this. And one of the things that I've done on that committee is to bring in people as consultants. So these are not necessarily voting members of the committee because I I cannot create those voting positions, but I can bring in people um, as consultants and have made very specific effort to bring in people with different perspectives, um, exactly for this reason, because we do gain from these different perspectives. It is important. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Wallace said that I just wanna emphasize, because I think this is a really important point, is that underlying piece of having respect and being treated with dignity is one of the most crucial components to true mentorship and allyship. And I think that it's something that can get wonky if we're not careful. And so I think that that part, and I think that this is especially important with graduate students because there is that element of seeking mentorship, which, and I agree, um, Dr. Wallace, my mentors have never come about because I walked up and asked them to be mentors. It has been, been something that has grown organically. Um, but I do think that those are relationships that can become abusive. And I think that it's really important to always remember, even if you are in a less experienced role, if you're the mentee rather than the mentor, that that relationship should always be coming from a place of respect and from a place of dignity and not from a place that then undermines, it should build up rather than, than pulling down. 
Um, in terms of that, that looking for people that have different perspectives, though, this is one of those pieces that we all know it, and yet we all still do it. It's not making assumptions about what people's perspectives are going to be. Really ask them what, ex you know, explicitly what their perspectives are, because I think quite often it, it is easy to make false assumptions and those pieces become just as damaging um, when you when you're not even when you're making the assumption that people have different perspectives from yours without actually explicitly stating them. Yeah, good point. Dr. Newby, what about you? What do you what steps would you recommend in finding someone who has a different perspective? Um, I think it starts with communication, right? You want to make sure that you communicate openly with your mentors and or your mentees and make sure that uh, you outsource and or seek referrals as needed, right? There have been plenty of instances where I've had mentees where um, their need, I, I couldn't meet every single last one of their needs, um, which and I think that's another important thing that we should think about. Like not one, like one person can't meet the needs of every single person, right? Or every single need that every person has, right? So what I do is uh, when I see that there are specific needs that I may not be, that I may struggle with, that I may not be able to need, I mean, meet, I'll make sure that I refer them to somebody that I know can meet that specific uh, um, need that they have, right? And if they need a different perspective, right, I could easily connect them with somebody who may have that different perspective. It's really just about using your network. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Um, Rupal, I have a this question here. So you work at Purdue University, um, you know, so we work at a predominantly white institution. So I guess my question for you, starting with you is, what can faculty members at predominantly white institutions like the Purdue's of, of the world, if you will, do to learn and be more effective leaders like yourself, and, you know, you're leading equity diversity committee, uh, mentors and allies for their students? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And I'm gonna start with the really, it's one of those things that seems really simple and yet seems to be a problem in many spaces. Um, I think the number one step is to recognize that not everybody is having the exp same experience as everybody else is, and that people can be in the same place at the same time and be having tremendously different experiences. And I think that that is the key number one element to becoming a better leader, mentor, and ally for students in a predominantly white institution is just that recognition that just because things look like they're happening in the same way doesn't mean that they're being experienced in the same way. Um, another thing that I would say, um, and this is for, for everybody, not just white faculty members at, at predominantly white institutions, is that that piece, um, one of the things that I think that we don't always do a great job of is making space for people to use their own voices. And I think that sometimes, especially when you're um, in that protagonist role and you're mentoring and you're ally, you're being an ally and you're out there and you're performing allyship on a regular basis, I think one of the really important things to be doing is to be making the space, but then not filling it. You know, making the space and then holding it open for other people to fill. Thank you. I want to mention to Dr. Uh, Newby, uh, Rupal, and Wallace, uh, if you get a chance to uh, view the chat because folks are making comments about your, your what you're sharing, which I really appreciate from the audience. Uh, so Dr. Um, Wallace, so I'm going to ask the same question you, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Newby. Uh, I'm assuming, but correct if I'm wrong, that you attended, uh, may pursue at least one or, or obtain one of your degrees from a predominantly white institution, but now you currently work at uh, each of you work at a historically black college university or an HBCU for the audience. So from your perspective, having maybe attended, having of course sent students to uh, schools like Purdue, so on and so forth, uh, what do you think faculty members at these institutions like the one I work at Purdue and others could do to learn to be more effective leaders, mentors and allies for their students? So uh, Dr. how would you respond to that? Okay, this is gonna sound crazy. I don't think it's too crazy. You should consult and interact and have dialogue with faculty at HBCUs. Um, if you look say at- Say it again, say it again, Dr. Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> you should interact and consult with faculty at HBCUs because if you look at it from a numbers perspective, HBCUs tend to have more diverse faculty than their pre-WI counterparts. And so when, they, when you wanna talk about diversity, talk to the people that actually engage in. And um, by the way, when you're talking about the, the, these controversial topics, if you're not making people feel uncomfortable, then you're really dancing around the subject. So I got to say, you know, it, 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 it primarily white institutions, 
um, what I find is you'll have individuals that may be there that'll be like, oh, well, we'll bring in this person, give a talk. And now you've addressed it, checkbox. This is not a checkbox issue. And so you, you really want to, first off, be ready to ask the question. Because if you're going to ask the question, you're going to get the answer. And the answer is going to probably not be everything that's going to make you feel good. But when you can get past that, have that dialogue with the HBCU faculty and share experiences. You know, um, because there's something I, 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 I've always said. You'd be surprised how little, a, how little B there is in HBCU when you look in the sciences. Because um, depending on if you're at a Tennessee State or a Fisk University and everything, that you might think, oh, they're just all black faculty and it's not anything of the kind. And so there are experiences that a faculty member can have in an HBCU that you think you would have had at a predominantly white university. So there's stuff to be learned everywhere. And so again, those shared experiences, seek out, have, talk with faculty and the experiences they have at HBCUs. There's something that can be learned. Um, and there's just sometimes we put so much faith in the name of that institution and you'd be surprised of the powerful things that are going, at, going on at the places that may not have the same name recognition, but are doing really incredibly powerful work. Uh, I, I love that response. I love that. Uh, Dr. Newby, Again, you're at Langston University for those, I mentioned again, for those on, on the webinar today, how would you respond to that question? Gotcha. Look, I do want to throw out there that Langston University is the only HBCU in Oklahoma as well. I think uh, a lot of times people don't necessarily think about how that works out. There are plenty of uh, states that have plenty of HBCUs. Langston has always been the one and only in Oklahoma. So I did just want to throw that out there. It's a random tidbit of information, but um. This is a really tough question for me based off the fact that I mean, I did attend a PWI, but uh, I guess speaking to faculty about what they should do to become better, what leaders and mentors and allies, right, to their students, I just feel like um, I would probably tell anybody, whether you're at a PWI or an HBCU, I mean, you just have to make it a priority, right? You have to prioritize uh, being a leader and a mentor and an ally for your students, right? Not only that, but you want to make sure that when you are uh, identifying mentors that you like seek those who are different from you as well. Not only that, but make sure that you are identifying all students um, for leadership roles. And not only that, but inviting them to work with you on your research, right? Ultimately making sure that you seek students out. And, and when I say students, I'm talking about all types of students, right? Um, and I think that you'd also benefit from doing the self-work involved in developing uh, greater cultural competency as a person. And of course, I know that Purdue and most other uh, PWIs, they have uh, major continual education and professional development um, opportunity centered on race and inclusion. And I think that will be a really great start for those who want to uh, start to become better um, leaders, mentors, and allies for their students. Thank you. Uh, I do have one more question, but I have really good questions, at least in the chat that I want to get to right now. So please, if you have questions, throw them in, put them in the chat. If you want to send them to me directly because you don't want others to see the question, feel free to do that. We'll send them directly to Stephen McBride and, and you, he, can, uh, facil he can funnel it to me. So I have a question for you, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Newby. Then I do have one that's just you, Dr. Rubel, but I imagine others could respond. But I'll start with this one first, Dr. Wallace. Really great question. Um, how can faculty or mentors reach out to HBCUs to foster intentional mentorship and allyship? So that is a, one, I'm glad you asked the question because I also know it's not an easy one to answer. And I'm gonna start from the kind of the backside coming forward. The problem is that when you have some of these interactions of a university wants to interact with an HBCU, HBCUs have been approached so much because they have the diversity. And so there'll be this, Ah, uh, great, another white institution who wants us so they can put on the books that they're working with some black people. Um, so there tends, there can sometimes be a little cynicism. And what I would say is that how you reach out is just sincerely put it out there and just say, hey, here's this thing that we've got going on here. And I would really like to make a change. Or I'd like to work on a project that addresses this. And I would like to have allies. And I want to have some conversations. Can we talk? And, and, and explore some ways that we could go about this. Uh, because then you're kind of, you're, you're reaching out, but you're saying, hey, I want your views too. In opposed to that, that university that approaches you and say, hey, we're writing this grant and we, need, we want to partner with you. 
we we hear that and we're just going okay they need an hbcu and and i can tell you from my personal experience there are two types of grant writers i've come to find somebody who's like hey there's this grant an opportunity to get some funding let's work let's write a grant and get you know do it or there's somebody that passionately is trying to pursue something and they look for resources in order so that they can pursue it. I like collaborating with the latter and not the former. And so if you're reaching out, just have a very transparent conversation, but seek their views. Don't come off as just saying, hey, let's partner up like, like we're doing you a favor. And I don't think people do that intentionally, but subconsciously it comes across that way and that it, it makes that collaboration a whole lot harder to foster. Yeah, no, I agree. I see it all the time. Dr. Newby, again, you're Langston. How would you respond to how can faculty and mentors reach out to HBCs to foster intentional mentorship allyship? <laughs> uh, by attending events like this and making sure that you're networking with those who you find yourself uh, in communication with, right? Um, as a matter of fact, I'm here today because of uh, the efforts of Dr. Esters and um, other and, and Triple AE everything that you've all put together, um, because whatever co connection that we have with AAAB and um, the Learning Center Teaching uh, Conference, it's greatly increased uh, my opportunities to be in places in spaces like this. Um, and not only that, but it's increased my knowledge base of uh, what look, diversity and inclusion looks like outside of an HBCU. Good, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so Dr. Rubel, this question was directed to you could you give some examples of what you said about spaces, creating them and leaving them open for people to come in and be and act there? Oh, that's a great, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have been more explicit with that. Um, I'll give you an example that's specific to some of the work that I've done with equity and diversity um, committee here, which is that quite often I'm working as an ally to groups that I am not a member of. And rather than just taking up all the room and just using my voice to then speak my version of truth, one of the things that I've been able to do, and I think pretty effectively, is creating space within that committee to allow others to come in and utilize that as a, as a place to amplify their voice. And then ultimately, whatever resolutions I bring forth from that committee, which this is, that's, you know, works much like Senate, you know, in the government, Resolutions come out of committee, they go in front of a full Senate, and quite often that voice that I am then speaking is really just amplifying the voices of others rather than having created that space, written the, um, the, the, all the words on my own, and then going forth with, with my own version of what that truth might be. Dr. Wallace, Dr. Newby, you want to add anything about that question regarding um, creating spaces, um, yeah, some examples of how would you say, you know, as far as how do you create spaces and leave them open and inviting so people can come in and be a part of it. Anything you want to say about that, Dr. Wallace? I would just say quickly, I, I wholeheartedly concur with Dr. Rupel about, you know, it doesn't always have to be about you. It's like, okay, I may have facilitated this thing, but let me bring in people who I know have worked in this field and let their voice be heard because one, it's efficacy for that individual that you've brought in, which makes them more powerful, but then it's also an opportunity for people for gain from their perspectives. And by the way, when you think about allies, that person's going to always remember that you invited them into your forum to give voice. And then when it comes time that you want to work, they're going to want to do something that's going to really help to benefit you as well. Dr. Newby, sorry, you anything you want to add to that? <laughs> There's nothing that I'd like to add to that. Okay. They did very well with that question. Yeah. So I do have one more question. Again, if, you, if there's some other questions, please put them in the chat. But uh, Dr. Newby, let me start with you. I wrote this down. Um, could you, do you, is there any one example that you can share with us today that you would describe as being the most impactful, most memorable uh, allyship, allyship moment for you? Is there anything that pops to mind, comes to mind? Uh, that's a really great question. You know, if anything, it would be my time as a grad student, as a PhD student um, at 
Auburn, there were times where I felt 100% alone while I was there. It was the great, like, so I guess this would yield me giving you some background, or some of my background, right? So prior to me attending Auburn, I attended two HBCUs. I attended Morehouse College and uh, Clark Atlanta University, both in Atlanta, Georgia. Either way, once I got to Auburn, it was a major culture shock, right? Um, and it was very difficult to find spaces that I felt like were 100% safe for me and to have, to have the conversations that I needed to have, even to find the support that I needed. And um, after having discussions about what diversity and equality, equity, and all these other things look like at Auburn, um, our grad, the, our, I think the VP of our grad school, he um, ended up providing us an opportunity um, as students. There was this organization called the Black Graduate and Professional Student Association um, that is connected to, I guess, the national MBGSA as well. He provided us the opportunity to actually recruit more uh, students of color for Auburn University. And I thought that that was a really amazing opportunity. They provided us with the funding uh, and let us do the work. So from there, we were able to bring in about 25 to 30 students each year um, to show them what Auburn could do for them. You see what I'm saying? And we were able to increase the numbers there. So I felt like that was a really amazing way for them to ally with us to a, uh, meet some of the specific goals that they had as a university, but also to meet some of the specific needs that we had. Dr. Rubel, what about you? How do you have a, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of that most memorable or impactful allyship moment for you? So I'm assuming you mean on a personal level. Okay, so nothing like requiring vulnerability in front of a Zoom full of strangers. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, yeah, so I had what could be most um, generously described as a non-traditional childhood and experienced homelessness as a teenager and ended up, I never actually finished high school. Um, on my office wall at work, not here, I've got my master's degree, both of my doctorates and my GED certificate. Um, when I came back to school, I came back to school through community college, not through a traditional, I mean, I wasn't even eligible to get into a traditional college because I had never even taken, you know, tests like SATs and ACTs to get into college. Um, so I walked in full of imposter syndrome and not feeling like I would be somebody that could be successful I didn't have it in my past history and had no reason to believe that I would be successful. And I had one individual, one person that in my very first semester of community college, I think probably recognized that I was walking on eggshells and that I, I was a flight risk. <laughs> like I was, there was potential for me to bolt and, and um, not, not stick with it. And they did a really tremendous um, job of not just, um, I actually was asked to, to come back for a second semester, but part of an honors program with, which came with a scholarship, which, I mean, it's a laughable amount dollar wise, um, but it made all the difference in the world to me. And ultimately I wouldn't have graduated from college, much less gone on to get three um, graduate degrees if I hadn't have had that one instrumental person. And I've had many since, you know, there's been lots of mentorship and allyship along the way. Um, but I think that, that that then feeds, speaking of that, it comes back around, that then feeds my desire to continually give forward and keep paying it forward. Because I think that there's always, there's always somebody that's out there that's going to not just benefit from mentorship and from allyship, but they're going to go forward in their career and just keep, keep paying it along. Yeah, well, powerful story, uh, number one, Dr. Ruba. And number two, thank you for sharing, sharing it. I really appreciate that. So Dr. Wiles, what about you? What about, how what would you say about uh, this most impactful or memorable allyship moment for you? Um, it's kind of like, uh, it was more of an epiphany that was the culmination of a lot of experiences. And what it was is, you know, like Dr. Rupel, I came from a background that not many people would, would think a physicist would come from. I came up very, very poor in math. And I remember that the the, the, the moment it all changed, it was a teacher, Miss Gamble. She was the perfect example of a Southern belle. I expected her to just have the little flaring skirt with the poodle on it, strong Southern accent. And she just said to me, we were doing inequalities. And she said, Mr. Wallace, you don't have to worry. All you have to understand about inequalities is that the alligator takes the biggest bite. I had not understood inequalities since K through eight. And in that one moment, 
in college in a, in a remedial math class, she said something that just made me think I can do this. So like Dr. Rupel coming up through my career was always combating the, 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 the imposter syndrome and you're feeling like you're, 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 you're obligated to catch up. But then one day it hit, I got a call um, and it was, or an email and it was, hey, we would really like to collaborate with you on this grant. And then there was another one. It was like, could we, we've heard about the work that you do. Would you be interested in working with us? And then an awareness came that while I was so busy trying to do the next project to prove my worth, I never took a moment to sit back and look at my body of work. And then it clicked that a friend of mine said to me one day, you know what, Kent, you're there. Everything else is just mileage. And it, so it was the culmination of taking the moment to stop and really look at what you've done and acknowledge that you deserve to be in the room. And, and, and that's, to me, that was powerful because when I look at that in terms of the allyship, these came from the people that I had made allies that I didn't even really take the time to realize that's what they were because I was always looking for the next, the next fix, the next accomplishment that I can make me feel like I did something. And so there may be people in the room that may have have that, that imposter syndrome or always feel like they're having to prove themselves. But I, I, I say this, you do not have to seek permission to be great. Just be great for the sake of it. Do what you do. Seek ex excellence in what you do, and you will be moving that needle. And it does not have to come from the acknowledgement of others. You will be able to look back on a body of work and say, wow, I didn't, who did all that? Yeah, that's your resume. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let me, let me say this. Um, I appreciate Ryan Cornegay just put just the word this with an exclamation point. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with Ryan, like that was powerful, what was shared by you, Dr. Rubel, Dr. Newby, and Dr. Wallace. That was today's mic drop moment. And so what I wanna do simply is say, thank you a thousand times over for you taking out of your time, your day, sharing with us today. This was a phenomenal exchange. I really appreciate, I'm sure, those who are on this uh, webinar today feel the same way. Uh, they're sending you some love, if you will, in the chat. So again, thank you so very much, but also thank you. I couldn't do this and we couldn't put this on without a great team, co-director Dr. Knobloch, Andre, Steven, Victoria, Zach, Cornell, Ryan, uh, you all are a great team. So this has been a collective effort by not just our team, the MAP team, but also you, Dr. Rubel, Dr. Wallace and, and Dr. Newby. So thank you, uh, everyone. There's gonna be a link. Andre's gonna put in the chat. You all can click on to uh, it's, a, it's a quick evaluation. So we really appreciate your feedback and you all completing it. Uh, this is recorded. It will be shared uh, sometime today and, and shared on social media and, and on, on um, via email if you're on our listserv. So be on the lookout for that. Share with others. But also uh, come next month, we have our Invite a Lecture Series, our annual Invite a Lecture Series. Dr. Um, Stephanie Parker, Stephanie, excuse me, Stephanie Page. And you'll be seeing correspondence about that in the next coming weeks. So share the word about our MAP uh, events. Please attend them if you can. Uh, again, we really appreciate you, Dr. Rubel, um, Dr. Wallace, and Dr. Ruby for sharing your perspectives. And so with that said, it's one o'clock. We want to start on time as best as possible, but definitely end on time. So we're going to let you all go. Please be well, each of you. Uh, be safe, and we'll see each other soon. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.